It's February 21st, 2019. This is a meeting of Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. Uh, I'll be presiding tonight. Let me note the audio and video recording of these proceedings. And we will begin, as we always do, with public comment. It's a chance for the public to speak on any issue you wish. I only ask two things. One, keep, one, keep your comments to three minutes or less. And two, remember we don't have a back and forth during this time period. It's your chance to give your opinion <coughs> to the city council. But you can always follow up individually with your counselors, and I, I urge you to do that. I'll start with the sign-up sheet, and when this is exhausted, I'll ask if anyone wants to talk or has not signed up. So the first person is William Diamond. There's Bill here. There he is. And Bill, if you give your name and address for the record, and the floor is yours. I'm Bill Diamond. I live at 141 <coughs> Grove Street. This year's proposed city budget includes a water fountain in this building. I hope this includes a water bottle filling station for two reasons. The first reason is that many water bottle filling stations include filters that remove much more than 99% of lead from the water. Uh, this is a benefit in a building with old plumbing. The second reason is that if you imagine filling each disposable water bottle, uh, we, with every one that we buy, one quarter with oil, it's a pretty good representation of the amount of fossil fuel it takes to make, transport, and dispose <coughs> of the bottle. So imagine all of them, one quarter full of oil. As climate change becomes more of an immediate threat, we have to make it easy to use refillable bottles. For the same reason, it would be wonderful if outdoor <coughs> bottle filling stations could be installed in Pulaski Park and in other downtown locations, and of course, in Florence. Thank you. Thanks for those comments. Uh, next is Tina Ingman, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Tina Ingman. I live on Park Hill Road. I want to say thank you, Mayor Markowitz, for moving forward on a study for community high-speed internet. And thank you to the Northampton Community Network Group for all your work. Um, I work in Northampton as a computer programmer, so good internet service is high on my list of city amenities. However, my reason for supporting this effort goes far beyond my work. Access and control of data and communications has become financially valuable and a giant profit opportunity. <laughs> Local control of a network will mean that costs to access our own data and communications are reasonable. With a community internet, we can decide together to make sure everyone in the town has at least basic access to this all-important modern utility. City schools and many other arenas in life increasingly assume that a family has internet access. A privately owned company in a distant city has no reason at all to ensure access for all here. Um, living in this valley, I've met many powerful organizers for change who <coughs> stick their neck out with ideas. We've got a national anti-corruption group and many other effective activist groups, large and small. It's not a huge stretch to imagine in this time of extreme wealth concentration that a private internet provider might end up being controlled by people who decide they don't like what one of our city residents is saying and stuff it right down a digital black hole. So the city council previously voted for a forward-thinking ordinance which bans privatization of our city water system. A group is working on Community Choice Energy, which is a start in relocalizing our power grid. In the same way that our water and our electrical power can be protected from distant control and unfair pricing due to excessive profit taking, it seems that the option of a city-owned fiber network might do the same thing for our own data and online communications. Protected community water, community power, plus community control of data will go a long way to make our city resilient and fair, and we'll save money in the long run, too. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Um, next, Alex Jarrett. Alex Jarrett, High Street, Florence. Um, I also want to speak in favor of the municipal internet study. Um, I think about there, well, I'd really like to remove greed from elements of 
pretty much every area of our uh, <coughs> uh, world. But there are particular areas, housing, transportation, food, and healthcare, where I think we need to uh, focus. And communications is one that I would add to that list. Um, <coughs> you know, currently we have kind of a near monopoly in good internet access here. And uh, especially with net neutrality having been removed, there is really no assurance that we will be able to um, <coughs> access what we need to access openly and fairly. So um, I'm in favor of the municipal internet study and having that come and keeping all our communications accessible, affordable, and not Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary Collier, would you like to stay seated? I can stand. I just all right. Take your time. Good evening, City Council. My name is Mary Collier, and I live at Tobin Manor. My issue is the snow and the sidewalks. As a person who is injured and is also disabled, I've gone through this recent storms and even today, walking from Tobin Manor to Valley Medical only one side was barely shoveled. From the fire department, all around the trusty building, literally to the jewelry store, was not even shoveled. So what it meant was I had to walk in the streets. If you're a person who's on crutches or in a wheelchair, that's not a good, not even safe idea because the drivers, when they're turning a corner, they may not think about how fast they're going or looking f if there's somebody on the, st on the street who has a disability. This morning, I had four drivers come within this much of getting me, of, of, of almost hitting me. This is an issue, we, we just had some more snow, and if we get more, it's gonna be even worse, and it makes it difficult. When I worked at the senior center, Con Street was never shoveled in the mornings. It was never shoveled. And I had to do the same thing. I think this is a very serious issue because I live in a building with seniors and other people with disabilities. That has to happen for safety reasons. Thank <coughs> you very much. Thank you, Ms. Collier. Um, is there anyone else who would like to give public comment but hasn't signed up? May, if you want. Yes, sir, please. There. Uh, my name is Joshua Yearsley, and I live at 292 and a half South Street. Uh, I'd also like to add my support for the exploration of municipal broadbands. Uh, we've already heard some very good reasons for exploring municipal broadband already, but I'd like to add one uh, to those reasons. Uh, and that reason is surveillance. Um, we all know that broadband is an essential utility that none of us can go without. Um, but as of April last year, uh, President Trump signed into law a repeal of FCC regulations that prevented um, internet service providers from collecting uh, much of user-sensitive information, including geographic location, health information, children's information, social security number, and the content of your communications. So at the federal level, we have no protections against internet service providers collecting this information. Uh, and for many of the reasons that we heard before, we shouldn't trust uh, corporations such as Verizon and Comcast to be gatekeepers of that information. We've already seen what happens when a corporation like Facebook has unaccountable access to all of our information. Um, so uh, for, uh, for Northampton to truly be a sanctuary city, um, we need to do more than uh, just to protect from uh, uh, federal um, action against uh, undocumented immigrants. We need to protect against federal action and multinational corporation action against surveillance of all of us. Um, the city council last year voted to restrict uh, the uh, installation of surveillance cameras in many parts of the city, and that was the correct decision but we need to go further because we are all being surveilled by our internet service providers. 
and an effective way to counteract that is to explore municipal broadband. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. <coughs> Anyone else? Would I like to speak on any topic? No? Okay. Um, hearing none, we will uh, convene. I'll ask for a roll of the City Council for that. Councilor Bidwell. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Here. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. And Councilor Schiff. Here. Uh, I would like to move up one item um, uh, out of respect for uh, special guests today, and I'd ask the mayor if you'd like to deliver any communications or proclamations today. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <clears throat> I um, have a proclamation uh, that I uh, wish to issue this evening. Um, as hard as it is to believe, next Friday will be March 1st. Um, so this is our last meeting of February before March 1st. And so um, March 2019 is Brain Injury Awareness Month. Um, the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas every nine seconds, someone in the United States sustains a brain injury. And whereas more than 3.5 million children and adults sustain an acquired brain injury, but the true total is unknown since so many go unreported. And whereas at least 5.3 million Americans live with long-term disability as a result of traumatic brain injury. And whereas the leading cause of traumatic brain injuries are falls and motor vehicle crashes. And whereas brain injury does not discriminate, it is unpredictable in its consequences affecting who we are, the way we think, act, and feel in a matter of seconds. And whereas there are many ways to reduce the chances of traumatic brain injury, including wearing seat belts while in an, any motorized vehicle, using appropriate headgear for sports participation, removing hazards from the home, making living areas safer, and performing regular safety checks in recreational areas. And whereas improved treatment, better access to care, education, and responsible legislation are making our major considerations when addressing needs surrounding brain injury, but the most powerful tool is prevention. And so now, therefore, I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, to hereby proclaim the month of March 2019 to be Brain Injury Awareness Month in Northampton. Let us support organizations and programs that assist residents with traumatic brain injury along with their families, but also educate our community about the extent, causes, consequences, treatment, and prevention of traumatic brain injury. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the city seal this 21st day of February in the year of 2019, uh, Mayor David Narkowitz. And we do have a special guest, uh, Mary Collier, who's a city resident um, and is a leading advocate, uh, not only in Northampton, but across the Commonwealth um, on this really vital topic of brain injury. So thank you, Mary, thank for you, all Mr. of your Mayor. work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate and, it. This um, is very kind, sir. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah, She's welcome to say a few words. First of all, good evening, city council members. The number is actually every 3.2 seconds. Um, the amounts of women getting brain injuries now is going up. And it's also the female, the males. Sports are the one thing that for many years, nobody even paid attention to. But now we see the NFL and other high schools and everyone taking it seriously. I was injured in 1979 when I was seven years old. The BIA MA was started in 1980. I fell and hit my head on cement that you guys have in your parking lot and hit my head so hard that I blacked out. I had no hair after my surgery. I had my brain stem operated on as well. I am very lucky today to be who I am and to do what I do. And I do it with pride and happiness. Since last year, I've had the privilege and honor to speak to the Hampshire County Sheriff's Office. I've spoken with the Ham Hampshire County Sheriff. I've spoken with the Hampshire Hamden County Sheriff's Office. I had 30 people there and I had them laughing. I wanted to read a poem that was 
done in Chicken Soup for the Soul. And it's 101 stories of what it's like. And for me, maybe by me reading this to you and explaining, this is how it feels in my community and how people see me. Because when they when I say brain injured, they don't they shut down, they don't want to talk about it. I've been called a freak of nature, abnormal, and that I sh I've been told I should be locked away in a hospital for the rest of my life. And I said, first of all, that's your opinion. That's not going to happen because I won't let it. And people who care about me will not let it. I can't. The, the poem is called Caught in the Middle. There is damage to my brain. It's a frightening sometimes alarming, and it requires humility on my part. I am caught in the middle between remembering and forgetting. Perhaps either one would be more of a blessing. I am caught in the middle between remembering and forgetting. I may have said this, this already, but the phrase becomes as casual as an appetizer before dinner as befitting a prefix. I am caught in the middle as a runner between two bases on a pop-up. Sometimes it bears repeating, yet other times stories and events are lost, never to be given the light of day. Or the fact, the facts that are missing, rendering the story, story similar to an old quilt, each eaten partly by moths, or as accurate as words are hidden somehow, somewhere. You know, it's like that thing that does that, that thing sometimes, you know what I mean? Uh, well, kind of. Or the relationship between the listener, how do I know that person anyway, and why am I telling this story? I'll tell you the reason I'm telling my story. I don't want anybody's mother, daughter, sister, aunt, uncle, child, anyone, to have to go what I go through. I, for the rest of my life, from that day on, I had, I will be in rehab. And rehab can mean remembering, having to learn things, having someone help me. But in all honesty, when I came out here to Western Mass, I got an agency that value, values me and cares a lot about me and I feel the need to mention them, and that's ServiceNet. They don't give up on their clients. They care about you when you're having a hard time. You know what? They stand right there with you, backing you if you have to get help. I am not ashamed in any way, shape, or form, city council to, to say, I've had to do that. There's no shame in it. There's nothing wrong with it. I've had to do that because of my brain injury. I have issues like bipolar, anxiety, depression. All of those come with a brain injury. I've spoken with people who say the way they're seen isn't fair and the way their brain injury is thought of and their mental issues are treated differently. And for me, that's just plain old sad and not fair. I will say that in the town of Northampton, I still see that the people who have mental issues and the way some people respond to them <coughs> is not where I think it should be. I think, and I've said this to this woman many a time, the chief in the police department have a bit to go. But I say that with no disrespect. I say it with understanding. I am friends with Northampton police officers like the captain John Cartilage, whom I have the greatest respect for, Detective Ryan Tellier, Patrick Moody, Adam Van Buskirk, and other ones. My only hope, and my only hope in my prayer, is that the way people who are brain injured and also have the mental issues are seen differently and that that talk continues because it, it must because it's stopped. I feel like it's done, it's dropped. The ball's been dropped about this issue. It's an important issue. Thank you very much.
And thank you, Ms. Carley. We don't want to keep you standing much longer, but I hope you stand long enough for me to say that um, we echo what the mayor said and the city council. Uh, I'd, I'd like to express our appreciation for your work and your, you. your courage and the things that you do every day. In and thank March, you for being in here. In September of this year, I will start fundraising, and it's a walk and roll that the BIA does. I fundraise for it because you know what? I can't walk it, and I'm not ashamed to say that. I do my fundraising, and I help spread the word. Thank you very much, City thank Council. Thank you, Ms. Carlier. Thank you. Very good. That was an excellent presentation. Now, um, we'll return to our regular order, and we will go back uh, to public hearings. And the first is an announcement of a public hearing. This is an announcement um, of a hearing uh, to consider the fiscal year 2020 water and sewer rates. Uh, by order of the City Council, a public hearing will be held on, um, well, actually, this is, yes, this is an, what we're going to do, <laughs> I'll give it to you, give it to you straight. We're uh, at our next council meeting in March, the first Thursday in March, we are going to have a hearing on the water and sewer rates that have been proposed by the mayor. The administrative code of the city says the city council will vote on those before uh, they are approved. Um, so that is at 7 o'clock on Thursday, Thursday March 7th. Here mm -hmm. we go. And we will get to this later, but since I'm reading this now, I will, I will read what the proposed uh, rates would be effective July 1st, 2018. Uh, the per 100 cubic foot rates for water and sewer uh, will be as follows. 2019? Correct, 19. You know, you're awfully good at keeping yes. me honest. Thank you. I'm just trying to keep them right there. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, the fiscal years kind of mess it up too. Um, but for July 1st, 2019, it would be for water. Uh, customers with one inch meter or smaller, the tier one consumption, which would be uh, zero to 16 uh, cubic uh, feet, um, 100 cubic feet, okay, CCF. That's $4.51 per CCF. Um, the current rate is $4.40. For tier two, which is if you use over that, over 16 CCF, that's $6.09. The current rate is $5.94. For customers larger with a meter than, than um, a meter that's larger than one inch, then your consumption is $5.99 per CCF as opposed to now, which is $5.84. Okay, and now sewer, non-metered, is going to be $7.86 per CCF based on 80% of your water consumption, which one's tied to the other. And then for metered, it's um, $7.86 um, per, uh, per CCF. The current rate now is $7.67. So I've given you a lot of numbers, but these are available uh, on the city website. And again, we'll be having come out if your comments on these things come out next uh, council meeting. March 7th, 2019. Okay, seven o'clock. So that's the first announcement. Now we're actually gonna have a public hearing. So this is in accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Article 7, Finance Fiscal Procedures, about the Capital Improvement Program. Over the City Council, we're holding a hearing um, now um, to consider the Capital Improvement Program that uh, has been uh, submitted by the mayor for fiscal years 2020 through 2024, so the next five fiscal years. Um, I'd like to hear a motion to open the hearing, please. Open the motion. Okay, so <coughs> made by Councilor Dwight, second by Councilor Barge. All in favor of opening the hearing, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? So the hearing is open. Um, Mr. Mayor, do you want to kick things off with your Certainly. plan? Just a quick introductory overview and then forward to hearing uh, the public comment and public uh, feedback and and then obviously later on in the meeting when you take it up um, I look forward to answering your questions and and uh, discussing it with you um, so yes this is the uh, the annual capital improvement program uh, which is a five-year uh, document that um, I am required to uh, prepare and submit to the council every year um, based on uh, Article 7 of our, of our charter. Um, essentially, the, the document is a, a 
planning document. It's not a fiscal order. Um, it's really a, pl uh, a planning exercise to really look at um, the, both the city and the schools um, and our four um, enterprise uh, utilities and look at what are the potential capital needs that we have over a five-year period. Um, part of the exercise is to go through and, and um, identify what those needs are. Um, it's uh, pr to try to get some initial cost estimates, um, including not only the cost, but also um, the ongoing maintenance for any type of a project. Um, and, then if, and then obviously identify potential methods of financing it, um, whether it's going, you know, what, how we would uh, plan to pay for it. Um, and, and then we uh, work to put all this together um, into this document. Um, I have to first thank the uh, finance director, Susan Wright, who really leads um, this process. Um, I do uh, um, a work appoint an ad hoc committee to help us do this. Um, which includes um, Councillor uh, Murphy from the City Council, um, from the School Committee, uh, the Vice Chair of the School Committee, Edward Zahowski, um, and then three citizen members um, who give up um, uh, a, f a few nights um, to sit with Susan Wright and to go through these and help um, um, vet some of the uh, some of the projects and and make some initial recommendations on how these uh, could and should be prioritized. So I want to thank publicly uh, Robert Osberg, um, Mark Sullivan, and um, and uh, Maura um, Megan uh, middle name Murphy. Megan Murphy Wolf. Sorry, I was getting it uh, discombobulated. <laughs> Megan Murphy Wolf um, in, uh, for uh, for their uh, role in helping us. Um, organize all this. Um, the document um, is broken up into sort of a, a initial summary section, which just talks about the program itself. It talks about some of the guidelines we use. It talks about the various funding sources. Um, probably, uh, you know, one of the one of the couple of the key summary pages in the document are um, uh, well, page nine basically. Uh, list the total number of projects over the five fiscal years that we've identified, which in this case is 116. Um, this gives kind of a breakdown by department, um, uh, <laughs> how many projects are by uh, department. It also gives a breakdown to the right of the various uh, how fund share of those uh, projects, the general fund um, and the four enterprise funds. Um, so it's 116 projects. Um, uh, with an estimated total of $87,023,150. Uh, and then on page 10, um, there's a really good kind of summary chart that basically shows you uh, broken down into the five fiscal years, um, and it gives you um, a, a breakdown within that of the various funding sources that we, would ident that we identify as uh, potential ways um, to fund these projects. Um, and I say that potentially because, again, we do this planning exercise, um, but then we um, come back to the City Council uh, to actually get the financial authority either to borrow, um, to, you know, which involves bonding, um, or to uh, uh, take money from um, our capital stabilization account to use free cash um, to, um, and then in some cases, a, s a certain portion of it um, will actually be in the general fund. Um, so that would come to you as part of the FY 2020 budget. Uh, that's uh, general fund cash capital, um, which you see on this chart is $340,000. So, so that's kind of a quick breakdown. Um, and then when you go deeper into the document, you get some um, larger spreadsheets, which will show you, um, you know, by department, the projects by fiscal year, uh, broken out um, by fiscal year. Um, and then when you go farther back, you actually get the project level description of each project uh, that, that whichever department submitted it um, with all the information uh, that we require. Um, you know, the capital, uh, this capital program um, continues uh, the work we've been doing to focus on um, our infrastructure. There's a significant um, uh, focus on not only our buildings, our, our, on our school and city buildings, um, our uh, roadways. Um, as you know, I came to you in uh, the end of the year uh, to talk about uh, road construction and the emphasis we've put on that, repairing our roads, uh, making investments in sidewalks, uh, traffic calming, et cetera. 
Um, we're also investing in our, in our IT um, infrastructure as well. Uh, and we've been making major investments, um, particularly um, on the city side, but also in our schools, uh, really doing a lot of work uh, now that we have this combined city school IT department um, under the leadership of uh, our CIO, Antonio Pagan, really making investments uh, to make sure that our students are equipped with the tools they need uh, for a 21st century education. Um, some of you may have seen a great story this week about some of the work they're doing in technology, um, and so there's investments there. Um, there is an investment, continued investment, in the, in the research we've been doing in municipal broadband um, that, that you heard about in the public comment period. Um, investment in public safety, uh, vehicles, um, some planning investment. Um, some of you may have followed the uh, planning process for both downtown Northampton and Florence Center. Um, we've, got a, we've got a marker, a placeholder in here um, for uh, potential funding to design potential streetscape improvements in downtown Florence, um, which uh, have, we haven't seen um, uh, those um, looked at in many, many years. And so one of my commitments to the Florence uh, downtown and business community and as part of that larger planning process is that we begin looking at those as well. Um, public schools have a number of projects, uh, again, many of them physical plant, many of them, you know, uh, keeping up with our um, buildings. Um, and then there are significant um, investments in our enterprise funds in DPW, um, which, uh, which many of these are, you're familiar with because they've been part of the plans uh, leading up to this, major investments um, in um, our wastewater treatment plant, which we're in the middle of a um, major design and upgrade to that uh, to bring it up to current uh, standards and modernize it and make sure that it re uh, continues to comply with uh, DEP and EPA guidelines. Um, uh, investing in our uh, water, uh, water systems, uh, not only our underground uh, transmission lines, but also work that needs to be done um, at our reservoirs with spillways and dams. Um, in the stormwater enterprise and solid waste, well, st stormwater, we continue to work on uh, replacing um, and upgrading stormwater uh, lines, much of it in conjunction with the aforementioned paving, um, as well as continuing to work on our uh, levy and flood control systems um, and making sure that we are remaining <coughs> compliant and doing some of the long-term analysis that we need to do uh, to maintain compliance with, um, with the Army Corps of Engineers, particularly on our levy system. I also note that there's um, a continuation of a strategy in this uh, budget by the DPW um, to construct storage buildings um, for all of the new equipment that we've been investing in. Um, one of the challenges we have with our um, uh, 1800s trolley barn uh, DPW facility is that um, as vehicles have gotten bigger and more complex and uh, heavier, um, uh, we've uh, run out of space to be able to store them out of the elements. And so uh, <coughs> DPW Director Lascalia has begun a strategy of uh, working to build um, these you know, storage buildings that are very simple structures, um, not even heated, um, but a, as a way to protect our investment. Um, so we've, uh, in past capital plans, you funded um, work at uh, both Locust Street and the water treatment plant in Williamsburg, um, and there's additional funding uh, in there for the Locust Street project as well as the, um, as well as a new storage facility uh, that we're proposing at the um, Spring Grove uh, Cemetery Maintenance Yard, which is the um, headquarters of our Forestry Parks and Cemetery Division. Um, Again, uh, there's some uh, breakdown of some projects for uh, the schools, et cetera, um, planning um, exercises. We're continuing to focus on renewable energy. Um, uh, so a lot of there's funding in here to advance um, the work that we're doing on our resiliency uh, planning and some of the work we're doing around uh, green infrastructure. Um, there's funding in here um, for some of the uh, solar resiliency projects that we've been working on, uh, particularly at the fire station um, uh, where we are um, in the process 
through a through a state um, grant, uh, the the end goal of that is to essentially uh, build a solar canopy over the fire station parking lot, um, and then uh, using uh, battery systems to store um, energy uh, to be able to extend the resiliency of that building, um, which is our 24-hour emergency operations center. Um, as again, as storms um, become uh, greater and greater, and we um, face you know, when you look at what happened in Hurricane Sandy, for example, where a storm and outage went on for a long, long time, uh, fuel became an issue uh, to fund, uh, to fuel generators, et cetera. So we're looking at resiliency projects to do that. Um, this is one that, um, again, uh, this is going to help continue to pay for some of the city's uh, costs relative to the grant project. So. That's kind of a quick overview. There's obviously individual equipment, individual uh, projects that I know you will probably have questions about uh, when we move um, out of the hearing and into the regular meeting uh, for you to um, have your deliberations and ask questions, but um, that's the capital program. It is available online. It's available um, at our city libraries. It's available um, in city offices. Um, and again, it provides our rolling, revolving sort of blueprint that we update every year for the important capital investments that we need to make um, as a city. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, before I open up to the council, let me ask members of the public, is there anyone who would like to speak for or against or just in any way on this matter? Please, sir, come on up and if you would give your name and address for the record, the floor is yours. Um, I have some uh, things to hand out as well. You're interested in following along as I read. And then there's some brochures that uh, if you're interested in seeing about our organization. Okay. My name is Lee Felcher. I live on Oak Street in Florence. Um, if you are following along on the uh, on the handout, uh, the last <laughs> paragraph, I'll read it as the third paragraph. So don't, don't be alarmed. Um, I'm a Florence resident and a business owner and a member of the Northampton High Speed Community Network Coalition, a group of residents and businesses interested in having municipal fiber network built in Northampton oh, geez, to serve our community. Um, if you came out tonight as part of the group, if you could just stand up for a second so the council could see that there's uh, people supporting it in the community. Um, Leverett has already built one. Westfield has, is in the middle of building one. South Hadley has started to build one. And many of the hill towns are building them as well. We don't want to be the last Western Mass town to have the benefits of a high-speed municipally controlled network. Although the internet was created in the United States, we now rank 20th in speed among industrialized countries, behind such countries as Lithuania, Hungary, Latvia, and Estonia. This disgrace is a direct outcome of lack of competition. There's no incentive for Comcast to innovate and improve their network if they, can, if they can make a healthy profit without doing so. Additionally, their customer support is notoriously bad, frequently ranking last among internet providers in customer satisfaction. <coughs> a gigabit fiber network similar to the ones in Leverett and Westfield would offer significantly faster service than Comcast at a fraction of the price. Reliable, affordable, high-speed internet is a critical component of the economic development infra infrastructure required to attract individuals and businesses to Northampton. It is for these reasons that we respectfully request that the city of Northampton build a high-speed fiber network throughout our city. From talking with several local companies like Crocker Communications and Westfield Electric's Whip City Fiber about building a high-speed fiber network in Northampton, we estimate the cost at 10 to $15 million. This initial investment would be recouped through customer subscription fees over time, after which they could potentially be a source of revenue for the city. More importantly, a high-speed municipal fiber network would create much needed competition in the high-speed internet market, where currently Comcast has a virtual monopoly, which allows them to charge too much and offer substandard service. Also critical to the safety and well-being of Northampton residents is the idea of net neutrality that a provider cannot tamper with or impede the internet traffic of its customers. Since the FCC rolled back net neutrality protections last year, Comcast customers now have no protection against predatory behavior. A municipal network controlled by the city would have true net neutrality protections as well as strong privacy controls to guarantee protections 
to the businesses and residents of the city. Many Northampton residents are frustrated and dissatisfied with Comcast and want true high-speed alternatives. We um, collected signatures on uh, petitions, both online and in person, which I'd like to present to the mayor. Thank you very much. Um, we collected 500 residents' uh, signatures uh, to support this endeavor. Um, the unanimous uh, response we received from people was, uh, sure, I hate Comcast, where can I sign? Um, we applaud Mayor Narkowitz for his leadership and vision in including funding in next year's capital improvement program to study the feasibility of a Northampton high-speed network. Thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. We respectfully offer our services and support as the city moves forward in this endeavor. We are eager to help in any way we can to expedite the process and do whatever is needed to help move Northampton into a future with affordable, secure, protected, high-speed internet for the residents and businesses of our town. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Very helpful. Uh, any other members of the public? For or against or anything? <coughs> Come right up. Yeah. Um, also me. I am Ryan Schiebers Brown. I live at One Valone Drive in Weeds. Um, I'm also here voicing support for the capital improvement plan, specifically also around the high speed community fiber network. Um, there was one bit of hesitation from a few members of the community that I wished to address. And that was, um, I have to hold this, I can't put it down, no um, 5G technology. One big hesitation that many members of the community had was once 5G comes out, won't that make a fiber network unrealistic as everyone will have wireless service? So in case anyone isn't aware what 5G is, it's basically 4G. It, it's what powers your smartphone. It's just the next generation, fifth generation instead of fourth. Um, it's, 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 yes, it's faster, but it still can be unreliable, and it can't replace a full wired network. Um, people, the major hesitation I heard was that once it comes out, we'll be able to have wireless internet in every single house via cell phones. But the problems with this are that 5G only works in a radius of about 200 meters from a tower. So you would have to have towers all over town versus a network just built in, just works all the time. And it also can't penetrate buildings. So if you were to be inside, say, the high school or inside City Hall, it's very likely you wouldn't have any service. In addition to this, the technology is incredibly expensive because it's only being manufactured by one company. So even if it were to come to the US anytime soon, it would be a very, very high investment for Verizon, AT&T, <coughs> or um, T-Mobile to bring it in, and especially to this area, because we're not a metropolitan area here, even though we like to think we are. Uh, there's just not enough population density to really support this very, very expensive technology. Um, let's see, yeah. So. I, I felt like I should address that to the city council in case any of you had questions, reservations, or thoughts about this. Um, and also, I would also like to thank the mayor, as well as Antonio Pagan, the CIO, for supporting and helping with this project. So thank you very much for your time. Great, and thank you. That's exactly the kind of useful information the council appreciates hearing. Um, anyone else? Would anyone else like to comment? Um, Okay. Members of the council, well, we're in a public hearing. We're going to be debating a resolution later, uh, approving it in concept, not the actual financial orders, as the mayor mentioned, but in concept. So more discussion can happen then, but is there any desire to ask questions or to participate in the hearing at this point? Okay. Hearing none, then I would ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Okay. Seconded by Councilor Bidwell. Uh, all those in favor of closing the hearing, please say aye. Aye. Opposed aye. Abstentions. So we will get back to this actually pretty soon. Um, all right, very good. So no updates from me. Any updates from committee chairs? Councilor Dwight. Um, I had promised you, <coughs> as per request of the council president, to update you guys on uh, the public on the uh, <coughs> Charter Review Commission's meetings. And in our first full meeting we uh, convened uh, Tuesday night in the hearing room and by the way for for 
future reference, these meetings are public and the public invited to come and make their suggestions and in fact actually the public did speak. There were uh, three members of the public who commented and um, expressed their preferences of, of issues to be reviewed. One of them, of course, actually two members uh, called for ranked choice voting to be considered. That uh, Another one was uh, in two and one in favor of uh, the city clerk's position being changed to an appointed position uh, from an elected position. And then also uh, a citizen who uh, want us to review the compensation issue, particularly as it revolves uh, uh, for elected officials around insurance. <coughs> um, also identified were some cleanup details. One of the things will be uh, uh, is the Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Uh, their vacancies, their requests for the vacancies on trustees' positions should be considered the same way we do the school committee. For instance, a convening of the, the trustees and this body to choose from its membership or uh, from applicants um, as opposed to the way it's set up now because they want, they, Northampton, for those of us who here know, but not everyone in the community knows, Northampton is a unique position of being the only community in the entire state that has two school districts embedded in it. And the Smith Vocational <coughs> and Agricultural High School is its own school district and wants to be treated as such in the, in the, in the, same, um, in the same way. And as such, they also want to be represented, you know, in, in presence at the annual uh, budget presentation too when we have a, a combined meeting with the, with the school. Um, then of course also coming up was the uh, discussion, the possible discussion and moving of uh, a request to lower the voting age municipal for municipal elections to 16. And, um, and then we also discussed how we were gonna go forward and how we break this up into chunks and discussion of course on the larger, more controversial meteor issues, which will, I expect will be appearing pretty soon, we'll have public forums where the public will be have an opportunity to weigh in on those as well. Uh, we will be hearing from uh, department heads and elected officials who will be invited to come and share their thoughts. And um, yeah, and that, that was, just, it was a pretty substantial meeting. Yeah. Uh, and we even got out early. So uh, kudos to uh, Stan Moulton who chairs that. Well, a great report, thank you. Um, at the point of information, are you going to look to establish a website of any kind with documents and? Thank you. Yes, that was discussed. I was trying to figure out. Um, actually, one of the things that they're proposing is embedding a link on the city page to a Google document that will be a live document administered by the chair and the vice chair um, that will update and highlight points of interest and points of discussion that had already occurred and then update them as, as we proceed. Okay, no. great. Well, thank you, Councilor Dwight, for that report. Um, any other reports from chairs? Any other just general announcements from members of the council? No? Okay. Um, very good. So now we have a couple of resolutions. Um, first is 19.003, a resolution to adopt the capital improvement program for fiscal year 2020 through fiscal year 2024. Um, submitted to the council on February 4th, 2019. Let me read it very quickly. It simply says, uh, upon the recommendation of, of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, um, provided the title, this is resolved that the city council hereby adopts the capital improvement program for fiscal year 2020 through 2024. It's made by the mayor on February 4th, 2019, in accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedure, Section 75, Capital Improvement Program. So is there a motion to approve this resolution? Second. And, uh, second by Councilor Dwight. So, um, discussion on this. Mr. Mayor, if you want us to provide <coughs> additional information to start, you're welcome. Not at all, no, I okay, just was great. preparing that people okay, might have you. questions, yeah. So, questions for the mayor. Um, I'd like, thank you, first of all, oh, was there something Council over here? Whitehead, yeah. Who is it, Councilor, Councilor Ward 7, please. Do you have something to say to start? Or? Not at all. Defer to you. So I just have some, a few comments and questions. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I just want to thank you 
like this committee of folks here um, for the study on uh, the fiber network. I think it's a really important project and was really happy to see that in the capital plan. I wanted to ask, you sent us um, information about the, uh, the building in uh, Spring Grove Cemetery, and I just wanted to ask, um, in follow-up to conversations that we've already had, and I have a particular um, resident of Ward 7 who uh, lives adjacent, who had a very specific question. Um, and I'm wondering about this document that uh, Donna Lascalia sent out called Rules and Regulations City of Northampton Cemeteries from August 2018. And under the section one, sale and use of lots, um, it specifically says cemetery ground shall not be used for any other purpose than a place for the internment, interment of the dead. So I'm just wondering how um, creating more there, we already have buildings in yeah. the cemetery, but I, I wanted to inquire about how um, a larger expanded building fits into that rule and reg. Um, so those are um, to the cemetery. those are our public rules and regulations that the DPW issues to the public about the rules for being in the cemetery and different rules related to the cemetery and you know hours that you can be in the cemetery. I believe that particular section. Um, is in a subsection of, of a section about what's the, there's like a subheading, I don't have it's it. Sale and use of lots Yeah. So the first section. So the burial lots themselves are a very specific part of the cemetery that have been uh, laid out. And I think when I showed you the map, uh, I sent you a map with the memo that specifically showed <coughs> all of the burial lots that have been laid out in the cemetery. Um, and literally those are you know, mapped out, and when we um, inter somebody, I literally sign a deed to those specific burial lots. So they're very specifically laid out, um, and though, and I know in the memo we talk about um, other areas that were also identified for future growth of the burial lots. But um, so that's really a regulation, uh, uh, mostly not really directed at the DPW. It's more about the public, and that when you're in the burial area the burial lots it's really a place for burial and for you know quiet respect of the dead and so um, so for example you wouldn't be we wouldn't want people picnicking or, or walking their dog or, well or at least you know obviously loved ones could bring a dog but I just mean it it's sort of delineating it from it's not a recreation area it's not a so I think that's the intent of that um, and then as you see um, the uh, the map that we provided the there's been a you know there's been a maintenance facility uh, or maintenance and administration <coughs> dating back to the 1800s um, and, um, and slowly over time as the um, extent of our cemeteries and then our parks and our recreation fields and um, all of the other things that that division uh, maintains and, you know, um, uh, equipment, uh, you know, we're maybe not using horse-drawn uh, uh, tractors anymore. We're using backhoes and things like that. So we're, we are, um, we've, we've, we have the administration building and the storage building. And so what we're proposing to do is to uh, build this additional unheated storage building. And it's actually interesting because if you look at the map, um, there's a delineation of where the building is. And you can actually see all the equipment that's parked outside um, on the map. And we included photographs of that. And that ranges from Everything from you know backhoes, trailers, mowing equipment, um, cement mixers. It's a variety of things that we don't have capacity currently to store. So it's a collection of tarps. Uh, we've gotten some small, like little, kind of like those pod units. Uh, you know, and even on the back side of the building, if you're there, they're they're sort of built a little makeshift lean-to um, to sort of put stuff under. So the goal of the project is to you know construct this building and to be able to put all that equipment. Um, you know, undercover to protect it, similar to what we're doing at the other th uh, two operating locations. So I do not, um, you know, th I th do not believe this violates any any uh, regulation about the cemetery public use, um, and clearly it's not. Um, you know, we're not building it on on either current or future burial grounds, um, as so delineated. Thank you. Um, first of all. I'm always very impressed with the process by which 
capital improvement plan is laid out and in all the participants in there and and the work that's put into it with all with the ethos it seems uh, to in, in many respects to uh, very conscientiously manage all these very complicated systems and, and that includes protecting the new equipment we buy if we get there, there's a lot of diligence done in review before the equipment is purchased and at the same time if we don't take care of that we we've already paid the consequence and continue to pay the consequence of deferred maintenance or absence of maintenance ongoing and I think that these capital plans of uh, the several years past have all included that in, in a rather holistic perspective that, that provides me some comfort. I would also add that uh, relative to uh, the, the, the municipal broadband proposal or the, re, uh, the study, I would ask <coughs> that you include in, in the request for the study um, the dimension of providing um, parity and equitability and social equitability in, 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 in embedded in that because I mean, part of the there is a digital divide and people who can't pay the owner's fees of a substandard system that already exists are currently using their data plans on their phones for uh, and these are people who can ill afford that for the most part and there creates a digital divide within the community or exacerbates it when we have to rely on a sanction monopoly that as as you heard in public testimony did, does does not uh, apparently subscribe to or have to abide by the conditions of competitive uh, services and uh, so all the other points that were brought up were ones that I'm very strongly in favor of I would add to that social equity and the opportunity to provide um, accessible cheap broadband service for uh, families who might not be able to afford it, so. Thank you. Um, yeah, in terms of the equipment storage, I mean, I mentioned it briefly in the memo, not so much in the capital uh, program. I mean, one of the other sort of 800 pound gorillas in the room is the fact that we spent a lot of time, um, and back when I was on the council, talking about the need to build a new brand new mm -hmm. super duper multi trolley dollar uh, <laughs> DPW facility right. and one of the approaches that um, that director Lascalia has taken is you know we need to make major investments in our infrastructure and so what she's been trying to do is really um, uh, make sure that operational locations make sense um, moving some operational staff around to, to create more space need uh, to fill more space needs and then this idea of you know getting the getting the vehicles you know with a fairly inexpensive uh, structure getting them out of the weather um, and be able to maintain them so you know she feels that you know these fairly inexpensive <coughs> measures um, you know are going to mean that we're not quite as crunched in some of the immediate needs we still have some needs at the DPW and there are still some deficiencies but in terms of a major portion of the the new facility that had been talked about you know eight seven or eight years ago um, was uh, was storage was you know getting you know because right now if you go to the barns you know the 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 <coughs> can't keep all the equipment indoors and the even the snow plows themselves are kind of stacked you know think of like you know a, a small New York City parking lot you know where you you check your car and then they bury it six cars deep um, and that's sort of how they have them arrayed in there. Um, and so from a maintenance perspective and from trying to uh, deploy them, um, it's, it's tight in there. We had to, several years ago, we had to reinforce the floor um, because it was beginning to show signs of buckling under the weight of these newer, heavier uh, trucks. So, um, so yeah, that's another added benefit of this longer term cost savings in terms of putting off the need to build this brand new facility um, when we can sort of make do with some Yankee ingenuity with what we have now. So um, on the broadband study, um, so uh, you may recall, uh, and it's referenced in the, in, the, in the program description, you know, we did an initial look at our existing fiber network to look at how we could um, better leverage our existing fiber network that we actually built with, um, with Comcast money um, as part of our 10-year contract with Comcast. Um, so there were recommendations about how we could do that. It also looked at ways we could leverage that fiber network potentially into a municipal broadband. 
Um, and so uh, uh, CIO Antonio Pagan, um, that's Chief Information Officer for those following along at home, uh, has been um, working to implement many of the recommendations of the plan um, for some of those internal uh, um, improvements, particularly in terms of delivering uh, better, cheaper uh, internet for our schools, um, which were, was previously getting their internet from Comcast, um, and now they're getting it from the city of Northampton. Um, and getting it faster and, and saving money. So, that, so some of that work has been done. Um, and then the f one of the follow-ons of that study was if we want to explore uh, broadband, you know, we need to do some other uh, deeper study. We've done a lot of research. We've had some great community advocates who've been, um, who's been putting information out there to the public. Um, we've met with uh, many of the communities that have been cited. We've met with um, Mass IT. We've met with um, MBI. Um, we've met with, uh, we've, I've done a, a personal tour uh, and visit uh, w with what's, what they've built over at CB Fiber um, in Westfield. And, um, and so what we're proposing as the next step for us um, is sort of a two-phased, uh, which is to do first a market study um, to really drill down um, and, and hire a professional firm that can really um, ensure that we have good data on there's a market for this. And I totally understand the enthusiasm of people that say, let's just do this. Um, uh, but um, one of the big takeaways we got from WIP City Fiber, um, who you know, began, you know, deploying this in sort of small chunks, um, fiber hoods, they called them, pilot, uh, was they really did a lot of this uh, market uh, research, which also identified areas for them to actually begin some of their pilot work. So that's phase one. And then phase two would actually be um, sort of the, the feasibility, not the feasibility, but sort of like, okay, um, if we want to do this, what does it involve and how much would it, how much would it cost? Like where, how much fiber do we need to lay? Where do we need to lay it? Where do the switches need to go? Where do the, you know, what are the, all the other implications, pole locations, underground? Um, and that's the kind of stuff that um, uh, we would need to understand um, before making the next step. So certainly, um, uh, the equity piece would then be probably more part of when we design, if, if we move forward, when we design whatever this utility is and this company is, th that would be part of that discussion as well. Um, also, it would, should be a consideration in, as far as demand as well, I think, if you're trying exactly. to. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And that will certainly, um, you know, that will, that's something when we, if we receive the funding and then if we, you know, uh, select the person to do it, that's certainly something we could talk with them about, about about the type of pricing that they may talk to people about. So um, I am, I am uh, trying to keep this moving forward, um, but at the same time, you know, as I stand before you um, with a capital plan that has the four existing utilities, public utilities, um, that require major capital investments to keep running um, and major capital outlays and, and bonding and design, um, the you know when we talk about starting a ten or fifteen million dollar you know building a ten or fifteen million dollar infrastructure, I, I think it's important for us to do the due, due diligence um, to understand you know what that what that could look like, what the demand would be, um, and and then also understand how you would design it in a way uh, that it could be self sufficient and and pay for itself and and um, and be successful. So that's sort of what we're proposing to do next in these two, two um, FY20, FY21 uh, projects. Council Chair? Um, three items, but I'll start with new school broadband since you're just talking about it. So it's, so as you just described it, the, it's two phases over two years. Um, and would we expect there'd be a report or a decision made after, shortly after those two years, or just well, really sort I, of? What I would actually think is, th I mean, I'm going to come to you, uh, you know, obviously the, the um, our plan would be to put this, this will be one of those cash capital uh, projects that's funded in the FY20 budget, so it would be in the FY20 budget. My sense of it would be we would, um, we would then, you know, do the procurement process and select that purse, that, that firm, um, and then, um, and then, obviously, I think we would present and share the results of what we what we found because obviously, um, that 
part of the reason we're phasing it this way is then we would have to come back to you as the, for the FY21 to 25 capital plan, um, and then we, this would be a project that we, then I'd have to come back to you, get your approval of it, and then get your funding of it. So, um, and so probably if, if I would come forward to you and ask you for the next set of money, I'd want to be able to say with confidence, you know, we've got this, this plan that says, yeah, we should, this is, um, it looks like there's a high demand for this and that there would be a market for it. So, um, and again, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's also important, there's definitely, uh, obviously Leverett and some of the hill towns are doing some things. That obviously, they're in a little bit of a different situation. They are not competing with Comcast. Um, they, you know, there is no municipal broadband provider in Leverett. Um, and the hill towns do, don't have uh, a broadband. Ironically, the state, after many years of trying to get it built out, is um, in some cases hiring Comcast to wire it for them um, and um, or other some of the other uh, providers. So they're operating in a slightly different environment because there is no competition and this will be sort of uh, uh, a, a municipal network with no competitors and there's no access to broadband. Um, in the other cases that were cited, these are existing municipal light uh, companies um, that already um, have existing electric utilities and gas utilities. Um, <coughs> and so uh, that's been a common model for not only here but across the country. Um, where you've got, you know, Holyoke Gas and Electric, Westfield Gas and Electric that already have um, some of the funds needed to make these investments and, and, um, and they have a, a board and they've made very strategic decisions about this as part of their business model. Um, we don't have that. Um, we don't, I mean, we don't own the poles. Westfield owns the poles in Westfield because it's their own electric utility. They've got all the utility trucks. They've got all the, you know, they've got all that infrastructure. So it's a little bit of a different situation. Um, and then there's, and so even then they've made this investment. They've built a really um, a unique system and they've done a, a rollout of trying to build neighborhood by neighborhood support and buy-in for it. Um, but again, even still in the neighborhoods where they've deployed it, um, it's still, 30%, you know, a 30% subscription rate, 70% are still with um, are still with Comcast. So they're doing it in a very measured way and and uh, making investments and um, and they're also, you know, the work they're now doing in other communities um, as their other sort of new business, which is to helping some of those hill towns install fiber um, and and uh, run systems. Um, is also giving them more capital, uh, probably, to invest back in their own system. So, um, so they they've got an interesting business model. But we obviously would be starting from a slightly different place. So again, these are some of the some of the considerations we'd have to look at. Um, and again, I'm I, I'm open to it, and I want to see. I, I want to see if we can do it. Um, you know, and again, back to the issue of of our municipal fiber. You know, we have been doing some. You know, we recently uh, GCC, uh, which now has its nursing. Um, school at Smith Volk is now uh, we've signed an agreement to provide fiber access to them. So we are, you know, we are continuing to look for ways to explore how we leverage our existing network, but then looking at this longer, bigger project of of creating a municipal broadband system. Okay. So. Thank you for that. Um, moving on to central services, um, there is an item for tax and for um, updating or doing. Uh, doing installation and construction in the tax and um, parking offices, and which also includes the water fountain for this, for outside of here, which. Uh, there will be a water bottle filler. Great, yeah. that's awesome. There will be a water bottle filler. And, um, and actually, it's not in the capital plan, because these are, uh, but we are working on uh, an outdoor water uh, bottle filling station in downtown Northampton um, and looking at some upgrades to the system that we put in in Pulaski Park to see if we could accommodate it there as well. But we are looking at some outdoor uh, water bottle filling stations as well. Great, thank you for asking. Uh, so those, but those are uh, not, didn't rise to the level of the capital plan because they're somewhat smaller modifications to existing systems. So, okay. um, but we are working on that. So for this item, um, it, it calls for security windows for Paying parking tickets and taxes, so just is, has that been um, has that been a problem that there are not security windows for that? Yeah, it's more about um, probably. I would actually, if you wouldn't mind, I would defer to. Uh, I'd have the finance director describe that to sure. you. Part of it is a flow, the way it works right now. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, and the way the counter is structured right now. And, um, and part of it is a better to provide better customer service. And, um, and there is a somewhat of a security aspect of it as well. Um, because a lot of money goes in and out of that office every day, <laughs> and you may notice the armored truck pulling up every morning, and um, and so that's. Um, but mostly, it's to try to improve workflow, um, and also to create a separate, um, some more privacy for people, and a separate hearing space that's separate so that parking hearings can be conducted. So, but I'll let the uh, finance director uh, talk about that. But while we were doing that, we wanted to also address some of the bathroom issues, um, including the water. So the design that Central Services has come up with would take, you know how you come in the room now and it's one long corridor. Mm -hmm. It's somewhat confusing for people when they come in because the first stop is parking tickets and then they have to stop there. They always ask the parking people, then they have to say, no, you, you can pay the tax bill, move down. Mm -hmm. um, so what we'll be doing is flipping the room so actually um, the public area will be on the short side mm -hmm. of the room those windows, that area where there's windows now, will actually become office space. Um, what we're also planning to do is have several windows so it's much clearer what, um, where you go to pay, because you'll only have a couple, you'll have a smaller space to come into. Um, there'll be a flow, so there'll be an entrance and an exit, um, so that people will be coming, if they're coming up from the lower parking lot, they'll come up from the elevator and that door that's right across from the elevator, which is now a locked private door, will be a door into the into the public space. Um, another problem we have is, you know, customers will come in, and they may have to wait a minute. And if they see someone sitting at a desk who's cashing out or doing something that requires some concentration, they tend to feel like that person's not paying attention to them or they're not getting service when mm -hmm. that person is really assigned to something else and they'll be getting service from another person. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try to make it so that the public sees the employees that are there to respond to them at that moment and that they're not seeing all the other employees who are actually doing a more a work task that they can't be interrupted with. Um, in terms of security, you know, we have had some, you know, it, people, people get really crazy about parking tickets. <laughs> We've no. had, we have had people pick up <laughs> things on the counter and throw them at mm. the staff. Um, that is an, an unusual event, but it does happen. There's quite a bit sometimes of hostility mm -hmm. um, over that. Um, I also think that the counter, the way it's designed, it's very, very wide. It comes up very high. We do have one section for um, those who might be in a wheelchair, but in general, that counter is not very conducive to conversation because there's like you know there's almost like four feet between mm -hmm. you so even though we will have stations with some windows people will be actually able to talk to someone a lot closer um, so we'll also be doing some renovations if you know that end of the building some of the windows were replaced like these some are the old wooden windows so where the treasure assistant treasurer sits it is so drafty in there in the winter you she literally has to wear her coat at mm -hmm. times because so we're going to replace some windows so a lot of this is just um, to try to create some more operational efficiencies to make sure that the people who are going to be handling the people at the counter are the people that the people see and they don't see all the other people doing work and it, and, and then think that they're doing right. work. so that that's part of the problem there will be waiting area chairs and stuff uh -huh. yes. for people. Yes. Okay. So we're, ju we're just trying to make the whole place work better because right now, as I said, people walk in the first, they stop at the first st station, they always interrupt the parking person. Half the time it's right. not a parking thing, so then they have to go to another station. And, and it's just not a very good flow. Um, it will also give us more floor space for the staff because yeah. the, the actual lobby will be, the area the public has will be about the same, but it'll be all in one area rather right. than that long mm -hmm. thing, and the staff will actually have access to the windows. So okay. I think it's, it, it'll be, it's a really nice design, so. Thank you for that explanation. Okay, I've got one more, and then I'll, let, I'll move on. Um, so I was excited to see uh, money for the next five years for sidewalks. So for implementing the, the sidewalk assessment um, yep. study that was done. So um, is there any more you can talk about that or? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, I think, I think it may be in, in the actual description, but I know that one of our goals is to take a look at the, the inventory that we have, and again, continue to focus on, uh, you know, safe routes to school. You know, mm -hmm. school routes give them the highest priority for for um, repair and replacement, um, and then also we've been using some of it to supplement. Um, some of the complete streets projects that we do when we do a street over, we often now will look to try to do a sidewalk while we're doing it. You may have noticed um, Councilor Nash, you know, in, in uh, Ward 3 when we did Wright Avenue over, we put sidewalks in at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we're so that's the other place that we're trying to couple it with other funds. So that's sort of the goal. And, um, and so we're just putting aside a certain amount into this into this fund so that we can start to chip <coughs> away at um, some of those um, areas that need either replacements or need whole new sidewalks where, the, where ones don't exist right now. But definitely the focus is going to be on strategically on our sort of high traffic, either school related zones or looking at, um, you know, opportunity uh, places where there's people that are walking in an area that doesn't have a sidewalk that you can clearly see that that's happening. Um, so we'll be trying to work to try to fill some of those gaps in our network as well. So that's the plan. Very grateful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Councilor Klein had her hand up first, but others have not spoken. So Councilor Thank you. Um, I too really appreciate the thoroughness of the plan, and uh, it's very uh, very reassuring to know there's a, a five-year plan that uh, an anticipates that. One, one thing that I was curious about anticipating things down the road, one of the big numbers that jumps out is $10 million for residents. Yeah. Two and three <coughs> years out, if I recall. Yeah. Could you just say a As little As if the $20 million for the plant didn't scare you, there's $10 oh, million. Oh, no, we've heard about it. We, we, we heard know about that. that. But, um, but I'm, I'm just curious about the $10 million for residents. Yeah, and you what, may. What we see coming along. Yeah, you may <laughs> remember that we um, recently won a, um, a grant um, from the state uh, to do design work on our, on our reservoir um, and spillway and um, uh, projects. And so that's a $250,000 grant, so we can start designing them. But these are, you know, these are the, are, you know, the dams and spillways that are constructed on our um, on our major reservoirs, um, and there are, um, in some cases, uh, repairs that need to be made, some structural deficiencies that need to be addressed, um, and so obviously those are investments we need to make in the water enterprise. So we are going to be using those grant funds to do the design, and then obviously you see in the um, in the capital improvement plan that we started to program those projects in. Um, and uh, you know, I know that when you have your hearing about the water and sewer rates, obviously that ties into uh, the need to build um, some revenue capacity as we move forward. We tried to keep rates down, and we've tried to um, make sync rates with, you know, as with projects, and make sure that we're not doing sudden sticker shock to be able to, like we're surprised by a big project, we see it coming, we're trying to build up some capacity. We're also looking at our existing um, debt service. Um, you'll see in the memo, you know, the water um, enterprise particular carries a heavy debt load, um, primarily to pay off the water treatment plant that we built. That's a, you know, a third of the revenue goes to paying the debt on that. Um, and we still have out to 2028, I believe, on that for 2028. Um, so, um, so, but we, but we, you know, we can't wait till 2028 to start making some of these investments, and that's a big one. And we've got some major transmission lines as well uh, that need to be looked at. So, you know, the DPW is being very um, methodical and 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 coming up with these. Uh, plans as part of our larger asset management plans, and we're trying to build them into the capital improvement program in a responsible way. And part of what you see in the um, in the plan is the, a breakdown of you know um, the combination of using potential borrowing, using stabilization funds that have been built up, um, um, and then other uh, potential funding sources like the grants that we're um, trying to use. In some cases, um, for some of the work we're doing sewer side um, there are um, there are these low interest um, loans that are available from the state that we're going to try to avail ourselves of um, that uh, that help um, support these projects so we're yes there's some 
there's some pro big projects on there, but that's part of why you do this plan, um, so that you know you don't have this infrastructure that we've invested so much in and provides clean drinking water to our residents. Um, you know we don't let it we don't let it fail. Um, you may have watched famously on Rachel Maddow's show her watching a, a, a spillway in on live television in California develop a small fissure and then get bigger and then get bigger and then suddenly it, it began to sort of fall apart right before your eyes. So um, we don't want that live video happening um, at our spillway, so. Okay, I, I just want to um, um, and, and back to the, the bottle filling station. I, yes. I too, I'm very, very glad to see that mm -hmm. moving along. And I'm also aware that there have been a couple installed in the high school now. Yes. I'm just curious if there are plans either in here or elsewhere for the other other schools, particularly JFK, to move into the era of water or bottle filling stations, which after all is consistent with the blue community status yeah. we kind of conferred on ourselves. And exactly. That's a, yeah. a very important component of reducing yeah. plastic bottle use. Definitely the environmental club and, and superintendent provost and, <coughs> and, um, and the principal at, at at the high school have been working as well as the food service director to increase the number of bottle filling stations at the high school and they've done some fundraising and the, and the uh, school budget has put <laughs> money into it and I know they're continuing to look at those opportunities. I can't answer directly about the, about the middle school. Again, <coughs> this would probably not be a project that rises to the level of a capital project. It That's would what be, it would be elsewhere. Yeah, so yeah. I will, um, I can try to get you an update on that. Um, and, um, and again, we're working on the outdoor locations um, that w for potential uh, bottle filling stations um, that we would uh, bring, you know, that we, that we want to move forward with downtown. Um, we're trying to make them centrally located, obviously, in public property, so we have access, and having access to water is obviously the other key thing. So, um, so we are looking at that as well. That's great. Thank mm -hmm. you. And I had just one final question, right. and then I'll relinquish it to my colleague. Um, three tonight. <laughs> Um, I notice a number of items in here that are, they just recur annually. Vehicle replacement, I know, yep. the IT department. And I, I just wonder uh, how, you, how you're drawing the line between what should be in an operating budget mm -hmm. and capital and whether the bond rating agencies are fine with annual <laughs> recurring costs showing up in a, in a, in a Plan. Yeah, I think that you know, ten, typically these vehicle replacements um, are our largest and most expensive um, items, and um, and I think what the bonding agencies want to see is that we have a vehicle replacement plan and we're following it, and it's a logical plan. And we have actually taken many of our smaller vehicles out of the capital plan and moved them into the operating budget. Um, uh, police cruisers are a good example of that. Um, ambulances. Um, and um, and uh, parking, you know, vehicles, et cetera, um, in some cases. Um, but in terms of these large things that you don't buy, you know, we don't, you know, we've uh, over the last couple of years we've uh, replaced a couple of our frontline um, fire engines, which are you know five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar investments. Um, those are the things you really can't build into a operating budget. So um, so we have. So we do have some of the, we do sort of draw the line on uh, the size and scope of the types of equipment that, um, that we can or can't support in the capital plan versus the operating budget. And the finance director wants to add? I just wanted to add that um, the um, 50,000 that, that shows in IT right. for re equipment replacement, my, our goal will be to try to get that into the operating budget, just as the mayor said we've done with ambulances and cruisers. It's just a matter of how much space we have in the operating budget. And right now we haven't been able to slide that in, but that's an annual 50,000. Another reason for some of these things to remain as capital projects rather than have them be an annual operating. If you're in the annual operating at the end of the fiscal year, unless the money has been spent, if, if, if the money has been spent or at least committed, it can be encumbered. But if the money hasn't been spent, they can't carry it forward. Whereas if it's a capital project and it's been, and it's been presented as such, um, we're allowed to keep carrying that forward. So that is so one reason. If you look, mm. like there's 10,000 a year put in for traffic calming. Right. Um, 
obviously 10,000 could fit in the operating budget, but the reason we keep it as a capital project is it allows us to encumber those funds even though they haven't been committed and to carry them over and say we're saving up for a $50,000 project. So, so there's some, some is just we don't have <coughs> room in the operating budget, but some of it is the way we categorize it allows us to carry it forward and build it up. And some projects you take more years to finish. Like, you know, we keep coming back to you about this Academy of Music design that we keep having to go back out and get more designs or the four no, library no, wind. Yeah, so that's also, they don't always finish cleanly within a fiscal year. Um, and then if you don't have a project and a contract signed, then it, like, like the finance director said, it flows to free cash and then you have to start all over again. So that's the other advantage. Yeah. Um, very helpful explanation. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Councilor Klein has been patient. I'd like to give her the floor and then Councilor Klein. Okay. Um, I had three things too, but ah. um, I never no, got to the rest of them. Oh, so sorry. I'm going to keep going. But I actually wanted to add thank you so much for the, um, the, the funding, the proposed funding for the, um, the water fountain here, because that is a request that came directly from a member of the public who comes to all the meetings, Blair Jimma. And I acted as liaison to the Central Services Department to um, make that request. So um, I'm really grateful that that was actually taken seriously. And again, I think it's a really important thing for the, for the public to, that you know, comes regularly or just comes one time to, um, to these meetings. Um, I wanted to ask about the Chromebooks on page 145. Um, the expense in this capital improvement plan is 205000 And I know that last year we authorized 176000 for um, Chromebooks. And at that time, we were told that we had just over 1200 um, in the school system. So I'm curious about how many were actually purchased with the 176000 that we um, authorized last year. And, um, and I also wanted to ask about the Go Guardian piece that I know has been talked about a lot at the school committee meetings, because um, I think we pay extra for those per unit, if I'm not mistaken. And um, there's a lot of question, I think, about whether or not that's a, a, a something that we want added to our Chromebooks because of the way it surveils children and where they're going on their Chromebooks. Um, so I'm just curious about how the 176,000 that we authorized last year was spent, how many Chromebooks were purchased, what the cost, the additional cost per unit for the um, Go Guardian is, and um, if it continues to be something that we're certain we want to spend funds on. Okay. Um, I, I wish I could give you those numbers tonight, and I'm going to have to get them for you between now and second reading. Um, I will say that, um, uh, uh, um, this is an issue that the school committee, which I chair, has had significant discussion, debate, has had multiple presentations, <coughs> has done parent meetings on, and has taken affirmative votes to move forward with the project. Um, um, and so, and in fact, the school committee controls all school property and all school technology. So uh, I just that is a starting point, including the Go Guardian issue and in, including all those issues. So. Um, and right, but because we vote, you know, on the, on the funding for these that things. That is 100%. It's a legitimate question. For it's a legitimate things. question, and I will get that information for you. I just wanted to be clear that uh, there's been debate, but the school committee has, the school committee um, actually voted to approve submitting these plans, including these additional purchases. And the, and the rollout of the Chromebook program has been going re re really well. Um, it's been, um, and, and I also want to, um, I want to correct a misnomer. We've had Chromebooks in the Northampton Public Schools for years. I mean, we've had them for years and years. Well, we, the problem is we didn't have enough. Uh, we didn't have enough so that, in some cases, um, every student in the classroom had one. They had to share, or two or three kids had to share one. Um, there were carts that would be rolled around the school because not everybody had access to them. 
Um, and so we've had Chromebooks. And so one of the goals of this project is to, is to make sure we have enough so there's, there's accessibility for every classroom and every um, student to know that they have access to one. And in some cases, we have a program that even allows students who don't have access to computers at home to be able to take it home with them. What's the age range of the students that are getting Chromebooks? Or that, what's the goal in terms of? At, at this point, we're now, um, we were, last year's focus was at the middle school. And we are now into the, this year. We're working into the high school, um, and then eventually we'll be working on some of the upper elementary uh, level students as well. Um, and again, this is sort of a phased-in program that the school department <coughs> and their technology learning uh, department has been working with. I can tell you that um, teachers are um, uh, very excited and very happy, and we're getting great. Uh, feedback from students as well about it. Um, and we've been doing a number of parent information meetings about it to address some of the uh, security concerns. Um, and so I will try to get you, and I know we've got this information because we've been provided to the school committee, um, I can get you some of that um, data in terms of how many, how many were purchased, et cetera. Um, and because uh, I can't cite that for you. Um, but I know we have that, that information. So I'd be curious with how many we have total in the system at this point, yep. um, and the cost of the ones that we're going to yeah. purchase, what that will yep. bring us up to in terms of numbers, um, just the cost per unit, and then the cost of the go that Certainly, we yeah. have to pay for in addition, I think, to each of the units. Yes, yes. Okay. And yeah, the, the certainly the issue of the um, safe, uh, of the software, of you know, the the, um, the software, the security software was talked about quite a bit and we're, and it's still, there's a, there's a working group that's continuing to work on that within the schools. Um, and so, but I can try to get you an update on that as well. And the last thing I think is pretty quick. I appreciate that Councillor Bidwell asked about, you know, what qualifies as capital expense. I always have some questions about that, about different things. Um, I saw that the rec department is um, over four years, going to have fifteen thousand dollars for um, maintenance, together with DPW of particular fields. Um, so that was something to me that the ongoing maintenance. Uh, I was just questioning, you know, how does that fit into the cap? So um, one of the things we've been working on um, has been uh, we actually signed a new MOU with the schools ar around um, around sort of our shared work together on our are share, sharing the use of our athletic fields, um, but also um, working collaboratively on trying to address some of the long-term needs of our fields. And so one of the ideas that came out of that uh, uh, process um, of, of crafting this new agreement between the schools and the city um, was the idea that the, um, the team of of rec department, <coughs> school department, central services um, would together um, work on investments that need to be made in, um, in one or more of our fields. And so the idea was to put together this fund, much like was described about to Councillor Bidwell and about the sidewalks, where there'd be a, a certain amount that would build up that they would have access to. I know one of the projects they're working on, looking at right now, is um, is JFK and looking at the um, uh, better um, making the the rest of the fields below Bear Hill and in that back part more usable to get them online because we have a, a lot of space issues around especially high school teams and even middle school and and some of the rec uh, leagues so that's a project that they're now collaborating on to look at how they can create better drainage um, better irrigation for those fields so they can be more serviceable um, so that's like a an example of a project so they're using some of that money from FY19 uh, to do an analysis and a design of what it would take um, so that's really so it's not um, it's kind of a it, it's it is for kind of maintenance type work, um, but it's larger than normal maintenance, and it's really designed to be a shared fund for the multi-owners and users uh, to be able to draw <laughs> from. So that's sort of the, what the purpose of that is. Yeah. Councilor Barge? Yes, thank you. Um, Mayor, on page four, the capital, uh, capital stabilization fund. Yes. Um, I was really impressed when I read this about the 
Capital Stabilization Fund mm -hmm. has been growing ever since reaching a low point in the year 2011, which only had a balance of $4,684. And now we're looking at the Stabilization Fund at $3.8 million. Can you explain how come it hit that low way back in 2011 and now we're up to $3.8 million? I yeah, think that's marvelous. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you may remember from my um, from my uh, budget forecast presentation and other ones we've done where we've shown the arc of our various stabilization funds. And, um, you know, when we had the uh, massive recession, worldwide recession that happened in the two you know, 2009, 2010 timeframe, um, that was a time when um, many uh, states and federal government um, had to cut funding. Um, that was a year that, um, right around the years that a state cut the city's funding mid-year. Um, and so many communities had to really um, use their stabilization funds to be able to stabilize their budgets, which is sort of the purpose. And so, Many communities around the state had really low, uh, had depleted their rainy day funds to try to stabilize. So one of the things we've been trying to do um, post that time period is to rebuild them again. And, um, and so that's been part of the work we've been doing with the council support um, to make sure that we are you know, making, um, you know, as part of our budgeting when we have free cash, you know, we use some of it to go towards the capital plan, but then we always put money into <coughs> these stabilization funds to build them up. And, you know, the capital stabilization fund is also highlighted in here, and, and you know, there's a formula that we're using to draw some of the capitalization fund monies um, from the fund to help support capital projects as well. So um, it's, uh, it's been a slow rebuilding process, but again, the key, and we talk about this too, is that that is a key thing for our uh, bond rating. Um, you know, when we, back in that 2011, 2012, uh, we had a double A or an A bond rating, and as we've been able to put in place, you know, building up these funds, as well as all the other uh, planning and policies and, and um, other measures we've done, we've slowly seen our bond rating rise to triple A. So, um, and that's a reflection of our fiscal um, security in terms of having the resources if another recession were to occur you have a way to stabilize the impact of that. Or if I you just thought that was important. It is. Thank it you. Is. Thank you for pointing it out. Thank you. Any, any other members of the council? No. On the question of the resolution. Okay. Uh, I think it's been a good discussion. Of course, we come back in the future to talk about specifics if there are financial orders. Um, so it sounds like we're ready to vote on the resolution on uh, first reading. Correct? Um, I will ask for a roll call on the resolution. Councillor Bishop. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor LaVar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Yes. Okay, the resolution is approved on first reading. Uh, we have one other resolution, and I will read it. <clears throat> This is in the City Council of February 21st, 2019, upon the recommendation of Councilor Lisa F. Klein, Councilor Maureen T. Carney, Councilor William H. Dwight. R-19006, a resolution in support of changing Massachusetts state flag and seal. Whereas the history of the state of Massachusetts is replete with instances of conflict between European colonists and the native nations of the region, who first extended the hand of friendship uh, to the colonists on the shores in 1620 and help them to survive starvation during the settlers' first winters. And whereas members of the native nation whom the state of Massachusetts is named were ambushed and killed by Miles Standish, uh, first commander of the Plymouth Colony April, uh, April of 1623, barely two years after the pilgrims arrived um, on their shores. Uh, and whereas the Massachusetts state flag and seal depicts uh, A, a naked colonial broadsword modeled on the broadsword of Miles Standish as it is being brandished um, above the head of a native man whose proportions were taken from a native skeleton kept in Winthrop <coughs> and whose features were taken from a photograph of an Ojibwe, excuse the mispronunciation, 
uh, chief not from Massachusetts, but from Great Falls, Montana, because the illustrator considered him to be, quote, a fine specimen of an Indian, end quote. And B, the native man's bow was, uh, that was modeled after a bow taken from a native man shot and killed by a colonist in Sudbury in 1665, and his belt that is modeled after a belt worn by Metacomet, one of the uh, Wampanoag leaders who resorted to a mutually destructive war in 1675 through 76 in defense of native lands against Euro-colonial encroachment. And whereas members of native nations within the boundaries of Massachusetts were subjected by the colonists to inhumane and genocidal practices, including the forced internment of thousands of members of the native nations on Deer Island in Boston Harbor, where they died by the hundreds of exposure in 1675, subsequent enslavement in Boston, Bermuda, and the Caribbean Islands, and the offering of bounties for the scalps of native men, women, and children. And whereas native nations in Massachusetts were kept in a state of serfdom, and their members legally considered incompetent wards of the state until the nonviolent action of the so-called Mashpee Rebellion in 1833 led to the granting of native self-rule by the Massachusetts legislature in 1834, as if the sovereign right of native self-government was the Massachusetts legislature's to confer. And whereas Native Americans were legally prohibited from even stepping foot into Boston from 1675 until 2004, when the law was finally repealed. And whereas in the year 2020, it will be the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Euro colonists at Plymouth Plantation, which gave rise to the long chain of genocidal wars against and deliberate policies of cultural destruction of Native nations, thus affording every citizen of um, Massachusetts a chance to reflect upon this history and work towards establishing a better relationship between the descendants of the Euro colonists and the Native nations of the Commonwealth. And whereas Native Americans have long suffered the many abuses of racism, the appropriation and misuse of their cultural practices and way of life, the appropriation and lampooning of their image and images for public schools and sports teams, and the diminution and pollution of their, of their ancestral lands, and whereas the city of Northampton, set up by Euro Collins in 1654, uh, recognizes that it was built upon the ancestral homelands and villages of the indigenous peoples of the Pocumtuck and Nipmuc nations, and whereas in its 2016 resolution recognizing the second Monday of October as Indigenous Peoples Day, the Northampton City Council acknowledged, quote, the ongoing trauma and historical harms acts of genocide and violations of the human rights of Native Americans and stated its commitment to, quote, uplifting the indigenous roots and history of and contributions to our city and this country, end quote. Now, therefore, be resolved, the City Council of Northampton hereby adopts this resolution uh, in support of HD 2968 and SD 1495 in the Massachusetts State Legislature, a, quote, resolve providing for the creation of a special commission relative to the seal and motto of the Commonwealth and expresses a strong support for Representative Lindsay Sabadosa and Senator Joe Comerford's continued advocacy for their passage. <clears throat> we have further resolved that the City Council of Northampton strongly encourages the Joint Committee on State Administration and Regulatory Oversight uh, to, after holding a public hearing on the resolve, uh, report it out favorably. We have further resolved that if the legislation shall pass, the City Council of Northampton strongly encourages Governor Baker to sign it and work with members of the General Court to ensure its enactment. Um, and then it's resolved that it, we send it everywhere. Um, be further resolved that the administrative assistance shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to the Massachusetts State Senator, to Massachusetts State Senator Joe Comerford, Massachusetts, uh, Lindsay Sabadosa, the whole committee I just mentioned, uh, Senator, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Ed Markey, Jim McGovern, and, and the governor. So, got that? Do I have a motion to approve it on first reading? Seconded by Councillor Dwight. So, <coughs> Councillor Klein, please. Thank you for that review of that long process. Well, I did um, it justice. Yeah, so I, I want to um, just explain kind of the origins of this. I was contacted by uh, members of a campaign called Change the Massachusetts, Massachusetts State, State Flag and Seal. 
um, who have been working for several years, and I think this has been introduced um, in several times in the state legislature to actually change the state flag and seal. Um, this year they're doing this campaign where they're um, going uh, town by town, city by city, trying to get um, local municipalities to support the legislation and put more, um, more pressure on state legislators. So uh, this is part of that effort, um, of course, um, tailored for our city. And I just wanted to make some comments on why I decided to move forward with it. Um, and I'm really grateful to Councilors Carney and Dwight for co-sponsoring it with me and working on it with me. Um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, which um, many people know is the home of the Cleveland Indians baseball team. And the well-known logo is a really disparaging cartoon of a grinning Native American who is known as Chief Wahoo which is a made up name, which is um, also a disparaging name. And this image exists alongside myriad other teams and that have mascots and logos that depict really crudely and really offensively indigenous people. Um, and as a child, I didn't give it much thought, but as I've come to develop a political and social conscience, um, I've come to understand that it's white supremacy essentially that gives birth to this manner of reference to the people from whom most of the United States was essentially stolen. And these racist images now we see are not only being used for sports teams, um, or I guess before they were used for sports teams, they were used on state flags and seals. And our very own state flag and seal depicts a Native American who's about to be killed by a settler, um, a white European colonizer who um, came to North America in the 1600s and set in motion literally centuries of deprivation and massacre, abuse, forced resettlement, genocide of the indigenous peoples of this land. And you know, when I've talked to people here and there about this, they say, well, it's, it's a depiction that um, is accurate to what happened historically. Why is that a problem? Or you know, it's a way to actually memorialize um, this kind of decimation, this, this genocide of a people. But um, when people say that to me, I'm always a little bit stunned. And I, and I think to myself, you know, as a Jew, if Germany were to adopt a depiction uh, for their state flag and seal, um, Jews being marched into a gas chamber, I mean, you know, if you think of that kind of parallel, it's just, it's really unthinkable. Um, I think we need to always remember and teach about our most shameful and horrific acts, for sure, um, so that we don't forget and we don't repeat them. But our emblems, our flag and seal of this state, I think should reflect our hopes and our aspirations and our values, um, not racist depictions of um, origins that we should be ashamed of. Um, I don't think a racist conqueror should ever get to gloat or depict the people that um, they've plundered or destroyed. And that's essentially what I see the <coughs> is doing. I also think that in this era, um, the Southern Poverty Law Center just a couple of days ago came out with their, their latest study about the rise of hate groups in the United States. And there's a 30% rise in the last three years of hate groups in the United States. And so I think it, it compels us even more to kind of redress racist wrongs in our collective history. Um, so two bills, just a little bit of information. Um, it was kind of uh, referenced in the, in the uh, resolution. There are two bills that have been introduced in the Massachusetts State Legislature, in the House 2968 and in the Senate 1495. Um, the, the House bill is lead sponsored by our state rep, Lindsay Sabadosa, and co-sponsored by Joe Comerford in the Senate. Um, and these bills call for the establishment of a special commission to quote, make recommendations regarding a revised or new design of the seal of the Commonwealth. So I'd like to encourage um, my colleagues on the council to vote yes on this resolution to support our representatives in the state house as they advocate for this little piece of redress um, towards the native tribes in Massachusetts and to acknowledge and address the, the white supremacy that fostered the inhumanity of the colonizers of Massachusetts and also just to push back against 
the ways in which we see white supremacy playing out um, and burgeoning here in our country today. And uh, just to be specific about the folks I worked with, Howard Clark and David Detmold from the Change the Massachusetts State <coughs> Campaign, who are really coordinating across the state, um, seeing that this is passed this year in the state legislature, uh, were very helpful to, to our crafting this. So um, that's what I have to say about it. Thanks. I defer to Councilor Connie first. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I do want to thank uh, Councillor Klein for all her work on this, especially the references in our own resolution <clears throat> to Northampton's pre-1654 past, and Northampton previously known as, as Nonatuck, uh, this region, and our references to the Pocomtuck and Nipmuc Indians. I mean, I think it's just um, really important for us as a city government to keep in mind that um, this, this area where we live and thrive has been here for many, many thousands of years, and we're relative newcomers in 1654 um, from folks who settled and lived here, and I think it's time. It's time for us to address um, some of those through the symbolic uh, means that we have in our flags and our symbols. So I fully support this and thank Councillor Klein for asking me to co-sponsor. So um, we frequently have very emotional debates and discussions about emblems and, and symbols and uh, the semiotics that represent us. And of course, these these are supposed these. Our flag is supposed to represent, the national flag represents um, e e a little less graphically, but it represents states and the original 13 colonies are supposed to be represented as well. Um, this particular flag now is an antique representative of nothing. And in fact, I would defy, and I have challenged a number of people already, Tell me what it means. Explain to me what the flag means, because the flag's supposed to represent who we are, what our values are, and what and, and how we see ourselves. So what does it mean? And no one to a person can tell me. And, and, and very few people even know the history of it. They think the history actually even dates back to the 1600s, the generation of this flag. In point of fact, that's not true. It does not reflect our values. I think, I think you can say that pretty broadly. Um, largely due to the fact that actually because of the supremacy that Councilor Klein and Councilor Carney referred to, their knowledge and understanding of Native cultures in, in this state are virtually non-existent, have no idea. So it doesn't represent even, even vanquishing a people. It does, for them, it means literally nothing. It's just a flag. Hard to replicate, something Keith can't draw. The, the flags... Symbols are powerful. A MAGA hat, for instance, can certainly provoke all sorts of emotions. Because it, what is it? It's not even a, it's not even a philosophy. It's, it's a stupid statement, essentially. But it is designed to provoke or declare or to enforce something. This flag, on inspection and, and study, actually says something horrific <laughs> and something that we should not be proud of. But for the most part, almost all of us didn't even know that. We look at the flag and go, meh, that's the flag. I don't know what it means. I have no idea what that means. And I would point out, if you look at this resolution, we have the city emblem that's above on the upper left. I, I couldn't tell you what it means. And there is a Latin <laughs> phrase there, and I used to know what it was, and I can't even tell you. And you can't read it. Don't try. <laughs> and, but. It is not, it, it, I hope it's not, and I don't think it is, as, as overtly, an overt declaration of supremacy, which is, in point of fact, what we discover our flag is. And so that's, if you want a flag, if you're going to have a flag, have one that actually has some significance and relevance to who and what we are and what we aspire to. And this flag serves no one in that capacity, even white supremacists, I suspect. So it, it is 
its time has come. Um, and uh, certainly, more importantly, the conversation's time has come, I think, as Councilor Klein eloquently put it, that um, we're due this review. And if we start at the flag, good, fine. We should have a more probative discussion than that. But if, it's, if it starts with the flag, fine. And we, we, you've seen these play out, uh, these debates over school mascots, uh, Amherst College most recently, um, and honoring, uh, you know, all, all uh, semblances of uh, Lord Jeff have been struck and have been replaced with a mammoth um, because of these same discussions. And you've seen it with regional school systems uh, named after various perceptions of what people think Indians are or Native Americans. Um, so I, I, I'm grateful to our representatives in Boston to advance this. I'm, um, I think, you know, I can already anticipate the, uh, the stunning mass live comments that will come, will surely come, and I don't care, <laughs> but I, I do care about this issue. I hope uh, that we uh, manage to pull off a unanimous endorsement here. Thank you. Um, other comments from counselors? Um, I will, of course, support this, uh, this excellent resolution, and I appreciate Councillor Klein's work on it. And I definitely agree with the sentiment that uh, the Commonwealth's flag should be representative of the values that we hold dear today. And I know some will argue that, well, it's a piece of history, it represents values, however misguided, that were accepted at some other time in history, and therefore uh, it, should be, it should be protected and kept. I, it can be kept and protected in a museum with proper historical interpretation, but it's, it's long time uh, for it to no longer be uh, what symbolically represents the values of, of, of our state. So I, I, I totally uh, agree with this and appreciate our legislative leadership in, in moving this forward. I would wonder <coughs> if on second reading, the counselors might consider a slight change that would make, it sort of moves back and forth between the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, perhaps just since the, the, the the legislation pending in the in the legislature refers to as the Commonwealth. Maybe it could just be standardized to refer to Commonwealth, but a very minor housekeeping detail. Um, but, but I uh, appreciate the, the work on this. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Chair? Um, at the Marge. joint town hall um, that was last Friday, both Representative Sabadoza and, and Senator Comerford spoke very passionately about this. They, um, they answered a question about it. Um, and so I, any, any help that this can give them in, in bolstering their efforts, um, I appreciate. So thank you for, for creating this. Councilor Barge. Yeah, so I want to um, thank the sponsors for putting this forth. <coughs> and, um, I have talked with some people um, who really feel it does not represent the values of the Commonwealth, and I have to agree with that. I also feel it represents the historic mistreatment of Native Americans, and I feel myself that that flag is racism. I think it was in the year of 2017 when Governor Baker supported the removal of the only Confederate statue. So I feel there could be a big change with our mass state flag. And I, I really feel that there will be a change. I will support this. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to comment? Councilor Nash. Yeah, um, I'm grateful for this resolution coming forward. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to add that, yeah, it's time that we stop uh, using Native Americans, their images as mascots. You know, um, as a sports fan, it, you referenced the Cleveland team, and um, there's other teams that do the same thing. And I think that there's there's other ways that we can uh, choose to honor and you know the 
the people that used to live here and, and also deal with the shame of, of, you know, of the history that, you know, they're not here today. So um, I'm going to be voting yes on this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, well, you're looking at someone who grew up in the town of Amherst. You, you know, Councilor Dwight referenced that. And um, not far from that town is the town of Turner's Falls. So whereas Amherst was named after a man who advocated biological warfare against indigenous people, Turner's Falls was actually named after someone who um, caused a, a, a <coughs> horrific massacre in the, in the Great Falls area. So we named towns after them. I think the difference is um, maybe words and pictures, among other things. Um, a word can change its meaning, you know, to a little kid who grows up in these towns. Maybe the word means something else. But a picture is hard to argue with. You know, the, the, the blatant symbolism of, of, of that picture on the flag, which I think um, could be changed. The only argument I can think of is what others have mentioned, which is <clears throat> some people may say, oh, we've done this as a matter of, of, of history, so we should respect it. But there's actually uh, one, of my, one, of, one of the most interesting quotes that I remember from studying um, like the, the founders of, of, the, of the country was from Thomas Jefferson, who was talking about the Constitution, but he said, the, the world belongs to the living. You know, it doesn't belong to the generations that are gone. It belongs to us now. And so there is nothing wrong about taking a stock, a stock of where we are and making changes to re reflect our values. So I think that is maybe something we should do more often in all aspects. But certainly in this case, I think um, it's, it's entirely appropriate. So I'm also happy to support this and I'm thanking these sponsors as well. Okay, so now I've said something. <coughs> There's no other comments. It sounds like we can take a roll call on this. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Labard. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Okay. That is approved in first reading. Uh, no other presentations tonight, um, so I would defer to Councillor Carney, the Chair of City Services, because we're going to recess for a special meeting. Thank you. And I will ask uh, the assistant to call the roll, please, of City Services. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Nash. Yes, here. Here. Okay, thank you. And um, as folks will uh, note, from the um, notes on the agenda, um, we have only one item on our on our agenda tonight. Um, I'll ask if there are um, if there is a motion to dispense with the minutes until our next meeting. It's on the agenda here, but if someone wants to dispense with Second. those, Second. okay. All in favor of dispensing with the minutes for this meeting? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And what we have tonight is just the appointment of Elizabeth Silver to the Housing Authority, and that appointment was reviewed by Councillor Bidwell. I'll turn it over to Councillor Bidwell. Thank you. I did speak with Elizabeth Silver last week, and um, I think this uh, is really uh, an outstanding appointment. I appreciate the mayor making this appointment. Uh, Elizabeth Silver has a distinguished uh, career in legal services dating back to 1976. Uh, much of that has uh, focused on public housing work. As a matter of fact, for three or four years, um, some, she believes, eight or nine years ago, she was actually uh, under contract to the Housing Authority one day a week to work on uh, tenant advocacy issues. She knocked on doors uh, to find out if she could be of help in maximizing folks of uh, food stamps. Uh, and, and, and other public benefits. Uh, she has a tremendous affinity for tenants, uh, uh, wants to work on behalf of equity issues and fairness and respect for them. Um, I think she would uh, be a worthy successor to our dear friend, Jerry Budger. Uh, this is uh, an appointment made to fill the, the position that he had occupied. So, um, uh, I would uh, recommend that we move a positive recommendation to the full council for Elizabeth <coughs> to the 
the Board of the Housing Authority. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, moved and seconded to send the name of Elizabeth Silver Madam with Chair. a positive recommendation to the full City Council. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, yes. I just want to make a quick comment, if I might. Please. Okay. Um, I support the, the nomination. Um, what I would like to say, I'm not sure who exactly I'm saying it to. I guess I'm saying it to the city and the, the community. We've had recent discussions about the Housing Authority and the City Council. And um, I like to just briefly discuss what I think the job of a Housing Authority board member is. Um, and I hope it's something that every member of the Housing Authority believes in um, uh, and, and, and lives by in, on, in their work on the Housing Authority. The Housing Authority board is the housing authority. The law says that every housing authority is, is governed by a board. The executive director is the person to whom that board delegates authority. And I think we have a housing authority in Northampton that um, has serious, serious problems. And so we do need good people on it. But one of the biggest problems, in my opinion, is um, in my experience among some, there's a desire to sort of pass the buck. And I think that has to stop. Um, if there is a problem, you know, we've seen the, whatever the controversy du jour has been, uh, air conditioners, you know, faulty elevators, you know, service not uh, being delivered to the people who live in public housing on time, um, policies that are implemented without notice, you name it. The buck stops with the Housing Authority Board. And I, I've heard too often, well, it's the executive director's fault, so we're going to sort of blame that director and not take responsibility for ourselves. Like any other person uh, who might employ someone or be responsible for them, that person is ultimately responsible for the people to whom they delegate authority. And that, I think, is a crucial thing that I would like to just put that out there to anyone, anyone listening. I think that is vital for the housing authority to start to work better um, so it can fulfill its mission. So I'd just like to say that, um, but again, I'm happy to, to support this particular point. So thank you for thank your you. indulgence. Yeah. No problem. Okay, so the motion on the floor to send the name with a positive recommendation. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, abstentions, none. That motion carries. And I will point out that we have three other appointments um, and I will speak to members of the committee about those they might like to review for our next meeting on March 4th. And is there a final motion? Move we adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, now, on the consent agenda, I will read the items at the request of anyone, Councilor, I will remove them for a separate vote. The first in the minutes of February 7th, 2019. Next, the question of the appointment to the Housing Authority of Elizabeth Silver of 67 Willow Street in Florence. And then there are three uh, referrals. That, uh, a vote on these in the consent agenda will be uh, three appointments, and a vote on them will be equivalent to referral to the Committee on City Services. And those <coughs> are to the Arts Council, Rachel Hart, uh, to the Historical Commission, Emily Estes uh, Belgian. Excuse me if I've said that incorrectly. And then also uh, to the housing partnership, Carmen Juno. Okay, so those are the items. Move Any removed? No, okay, so second. made and seconded. No discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed to the abstentions? Thank you very much. And now we will recess for the Committee on Finance. Excellent. Laura, would you call our roll, please? <coughs> Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Labarge. Present. And Councillor Shera. Here. Excellent. The first item is approval of our minutes of February 7th. Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Thank Aye. you. Uh, and now some financial orders. Uh, the first one is 19.002. On the recommendation of the Mayor and the Planning and Sustainability and the Conservation Committee, Commission, whereas the Open Space and Recreation and Multi-Use Trail Plan 2018 to 2025 recommends preserving the corridor along the Connecticut River and the adjacent floodplain. This includes the area immediately adjacent to the Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary and further it recommends 
uh, st strengthening partnerships, including with the Massachusetts Audubon Society. And whereas the city has an option to purchase four and a half acres on East Hampton Road from Ralph Thompson, adjacent to the Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary, along uh, along an oxbow of the Connecticut River for one dollar, or <coughs> as a deed in lieu of tax title foreclosure. And whereas said land has no development value but is of important conservation value, order that the mayor is authorized to purchase said land for city purposes. Further, that the city council declares such land surplus to city purposes and authorizes the city to donate the land to the Massachusetts Audubon Society for permanent open space preservation, subject to the city through its conservation commission holding a conservation restriction as defined in Mass General Law, Chapter 184, Subsection 31, and that the City Council hereby accepts such conservation restriction. Do we have a motion of finance? Second? Second. And here's the mayor to. Self explanatory, and mm -hmm. this is a key parcel that Arcadia would like to see added to its, uh, to the, to, to its conservation lands, and mm -hmm. we have a Owner, a landowner who's willing to sell it to us for a dollar, and we will accept it, and then um, hold the restriction, and and this will be really vital, and it'll be preserved. So, so it's in, in tax title now. I believe that's the case, and I believe that uh, we have the ability to cover that through our um, through our tax title program and mm -hmm. get it off the books. Mm -hmm. So, and it's it's also a very low value land, so it's not it's a, not developable at all. It's not developable. Yeah. Okay. Any questions for the mayor on this one? Doesn't look like it. All right, then all in favor of a positive rec recommendation of finance, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Uh, next is 19004, an order to reprogram Memorial Hall repair surplus to the s to senior center repairs. Order that $12,000 of surplus funds that remain in the Memorial Hall repair capital project uh, following the completion of that project be re reprogrammed for purposes of making repairs to the exterior siding and trim at the Northampton Senior Center to an account uh, to be named Senior Center Repairs. Do we have a motion of finance? Second. Second. Any questions for the mayor on this one? This is just some, again, some uh, tailings from that Memorial Hall project. Um, Central Services wants to address some issues of uh, the siding on the building, the siding and the trim. Um, there's been some uh, some signs of some rot and some other water related stuff showing down near the down near the uh, base of the building. Um, you know, it's a relatively new building, but it's now 10 plus years old. So um, so this is uh, trying to just address those issues that have cropped up. So that's why we're going to transfer this money over to do this work. Any other questions? Then all in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Um, the next is 19005, an order for FY19 budget transfers. Uh, the following FY19 budgetary transfers be, be and hereby are made. Um, medical insurance, uh, and again, this is the description, um, employee health insurance. Um, we're taking $39,306 from that location. Um, fire rescue, um, R and M vehicles, nine thousand is going to receive. Um, transfer two is the health and benefits transferring from um, fire rescue vehicles, ninety five hundred dollars. Public safety communication center replacement of equipment, seven thousand eight hundred and sixty seven dollars. Public safety communications uh, software licenses, seventeen thousand four hundred and thirty nine dollars. Public Safety Communications Center travel, $2,000, and Public Safety Communications Center staff development, $2,500. So um, the total is $39,306. Um, do we have a motion in finance? Make a motion. Second? Second. Okay. These are some uh, sort of end of year, uh, budget year um, issues that we need to address in these O&M um, budgets for both fire rescue and dispatch. Um, on the uh, on the fire rescue side, we had a um, unanticipated repair uh, to a ladder truck um, that had some wiring issues, and then our uh, turbo blew an engine one, 
So um, we had to have some uh, work done on it that uh, the normal maintenance via uh, a budget for the fire rescue department, it, it exceeded. Um, so we're going to, you know, uh, put this additional funds in there uh, to cover that. On the public safety side, um, we had an unanticipated um, repair uh, that needed to happen to the Keltron uh, fire alarm monitoring system. Um, that's the probably the that's that's the <coughs> seven eight, seven eight sixty seven. Um, and then we had um, some <coughs> software licensing fees that there was some. Uh, some miscommunication about where which budget those would reside in and they need to reside in the um, they should have resided in the public safety dispatch budget um, and so we need to make sure we account for those uh, fees for some various software that they use um, in their dispatching and in their interaction with the um, with the fire uh, station dispatching system the travel and staff development um, is uh, we send all of our all of our dispatchers um, have to go out for for training um, and unfortunately the Western Mass training center was closed um, and so there were no trainings being offered in Western Mass so we were then being having to send people further east um, which was raising their travel um, expenses and um, and some of the costs related to that so that's what this um, that's what adding this additional you know Forty-five hundred dollars to that um, travel and training development budget is for to cover those additional costs. So these are sort of we're getting into the you know uh, approaching the final quarter of the fiscal year, and we want to make sure that we um, we make sure that these accounts are fully populated. Mm -hmm. So again, this is all money that's in the budget; it's just yes, being it reprogrammed. Is. Yes, we're just a, it's already appropriated money, and we um, uh, and so we're moving it. Any questions from anybody? Oh, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and the final one is 19007, an order for FY19 budget transfers. And these are the transfers we spoke about uh, in executive session earlier. Uh, these are all coming from the salary reserve. It's a total of $123.422. And I'm going to read where, there, where that money is going. May I need a few more zeros on that, Counselor? Ooh. You said $123. Uh, no, 123422 dollars. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, no, it's a $120,000. Uh, and here's where that money is going, the breakdown of it. Um, arts and culture, 3,777. The assessor, 273. The auditor, 3,229. The building department, 1,000. $726, central services, $15,578, uh, the city clerk, $646, the city council, $468, dispatch, $29,509, engineering and administration, $331, fire, $3,822, health, $255, highway $744, human resources $11,416, IT $10,234, the mayor's office $10,870, parking enforcement $7,471, parking maintenance $5,141, planning $1,700, and $89, police $5,904, uh, the rec department $2,799, senior services $1,129, treasurer collector $5,715, and veteran services $595 for a total again of $123,422. Do we have a motion to finance? A motion. Second? Okay, any questions? No questions on this one? Very good. Then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And that is the end of our agenda. So if no one has anything new, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go through a series of financial orders. So uh, counselors who are quick on making motions and seconding them will facilitate <laughs> us getting through them. Um, wink, wink. And you'll get, you know, hard candies or other. Okay. I, this is a prize drawer, actually. <laughs> um, 
All right, uh, now I'm causing a delay. So uh, first, 19009 in order to establish water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2020. Previously read, essentially, at the beginning of the meeting. There's a motion to refer move this. I know. Uh, move. To, uh, we can go right to a referral, that's okay. Right, move to the refer referral. Referral to second. financial um, the committee on finance, and seconded by Councilor Klein. <coughs> Any discussion on referral? All those in favor of referral, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that is referred. Um, uh, next, uh, financial orders on first reading, 19002, in order to purchase, declare surplus, and donate land in East Hampton Road to Massachusetts Audubon Society for conservation purposes. Motion. Second. Made and seconded. Any discussion on this? Roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Donald. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Is approved on first reading. Next, 19004, in order to reprogram Memorial Hall repair surplus to senior center repairs. Second. 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 Any discussion on this? Roll call. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Yes. Okay, that is approved on first reading. Next is 19005 in order for FY uh, 2019 budget transfers. Okay. Seconded by? Second. Councillor Carney. Thank you. Any discussion on this? Roll call. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Approved on first reading. Next, 19007 order for FY 2009 budget transfers. That was the last one you heard in the, in the meeting. So, motion to approve this. Second. Second by Councilor Labarge. Discussion. Um, roll call. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Suspend the rules. Second, suspending rules. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the suspension of rules to allow for a second reading tonight? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Rules are suspended. Motion to approve. Second reading comes from me. And seconded Second. by Councillor Klein. <laughs> um, discussion. Hearing none. Roll call. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Thank you. Um, now, a series of financial orders that are all on second reading. We've already voted on them and discussed them at our meeting at the last time. Uh, the first is 18233 in order to require land on Chestnut Mountain Road in Hatfield for water supply protection. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second, Second by Councilor Sher. Any discussion on the motion? Roll we'll call. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yeah. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. <coughs> um, next is 18236 in order to reprogram. Academy Music Funds from Foundation Repair to Stage Door Handicap Access. Ooh, cool, second. And second, a discussion. Hearing none, I'll ask for a roll call on this financial order. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. So that's approved in second reading. Next, 18237, order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for creation of affordable housing units at Village Hill Apartments. Um, second. Very good. Uh, discussion. Hearing no discussion, roll call. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. And Councillor Sheriff. Yes. That's approved on second reading. Next is 18238 in order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for Parsons Brook Pine Barrens Acquisition Project. Oh, please. Second. And seconded. Discussion. There no discussion on second reading. I'll ask for a roll call. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Goodwell. Yes. 
Approval second reading. Next, 18239, order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for Rocky Hill Trail at Burt's Buck. Second. And second, and then discussion on second reading. Roll call. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yeah. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. And Councillor Klein. Yes. Uh, and finally, uh, 18240, in order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for restoration of 125-year-old window at Forbes Library. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion? Second reading? Uh, roll call, please. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yeah. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Kleine. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Um, any new business this evening? Be, be advised that um, I'm pretty sure I can just adjourn these meetings by doing it without a vote, but I want to check Robert's rules. So if that happens next time, don't be upset you don't get to vote again. Oh, what? what? Just I, what? Because this is the most awkward vote of the night. Yeah. Okay. So it's made and Motion so made. seconded, adjourned. I'll second. Okay, okay. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Thank you. Sounds like a power grab.